Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's uh, kind of springy, kind of wintry, uh, but regardless of what the weather is, it's good to spend the, the morning in the house of the Lord. Um, I'm going to open up with a, just a couple of verses out of Psalm 18, and starting in verse 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. And then over in verse 27, You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. We can be thankful this morning that we have the opportunity to praise this wonderful God, to, to give thanks to him, to, pr- to, uh, to pray to him, to seek his face and his will. It is a joy. And to know through all of this that God is the one who turns our darkness into light. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We praise you for this opportunity to come before you today, to lift our voices to you in song, in prayer, in worship. Bless our time together. May you be glorified, honored, and praised. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Where's Ben? Oh, uh, you brought up a song that you then apparently didn't know, and it's been in my head all week long. So I looked that up. It's uh, in my heart that rings a melody, written by a Mr. Elton Roth in the year 1970. 
99 years ago, 1923, he said the hymn came suddenly to him while assisting with evangelism in Texas in 1923. He recalled, that evening I introduced the song by having more than 200 boys and girls sing it at the open air meeting. Have any of us ever actually been to an open air meeting? A few of us. After which the audience joined in the singing. I was thrilled as it seemed my whole being was transformed into a song. I just think that's so neat that God can, because he's never done it with me, um, give somebody something like this just as he says suddenly. And 99 years later, we can still sing it. And it's still true. And it can still get in your head and get stuck there. So maybe that'll happen to you this week.
Now that is our hope. Our hope in Jesus, not in ourselves, is that we will someday stand before the throne faultless. I think it's in Jude uh, 24. It says, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, to make you stand faultless, blameless, before the throne of God. That excites me. I don't, I'm not sometimes big on showing excitement, but it's in here. I hope it's in you too. We, we are New Englanders. We don't necessarily always show a lot of excitement. But I hope that makes your heart go pitter-pat, to stand faultless before the throne of God. It's only in Christ. Mm -hmm. Not one of us can do that except through him.
You know, it is, it is funny when you think of that something that consists of vibrations and mechanical striking 
of one object against the next can create sounds that are so amazing. And how music, which is made up of things striking one thing striking another or vibrations of strings or any number of different things, music can stir the soul and elicit emotions that are so deep and and amazing. Uh, you know, it's just amazing how God can use something as simple as that to touch our hearts and our lives. And I'll talk more about the music a little bit as I get to the message today. Um, but it's been a blessing, and thank you for that. As we get ready for the Lord's Supper, remembering the Lord's Supper and what Jesus has done, I'm going to read out of Matthew chapter 27. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. From the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Darkness set over the land. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, as we remember the Last Supper, and Jesus breaking the bread and sharing the cup, remembering his broken body and his shed blood for each one of us. Ultimately, it comes down to this. Jesus Christ was forsaken by God so that we would not have to be. Jesus Christ suffered on the cross. Yes, his, his body being broken, his blood being shed. So that by faith in him, by trusting in him and resting in him, we would not suffer that isolation. We would not suffer that punishment. We would not suffer the darkness and the pain that Jesus Christ felt. So as we come to the table today, look at your hearts, look at where you are. Are you in a relationship with God so that you can get something from him? Or are you in a relationship with God because he loves you and you love him? Rest in that amazing love of Jesus Christ. Examine your hearts. If there's anything there, confess it before God. Yield it to him. Rest in that ever-present love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that is in Christ. Be thankful for that broken bread and the shared cup. Jesus did it for you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for your great and awesome love. We thank you that Jesus Christ, our living Savior and Redeemer, was willing to lay down his life for us, to suffer that separation from you, to be forsaken 
Lord, so that we would not need to. May we yield our lives to you, Lord. May we remember that sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May it be life-changing in us, Lord. And may we praise and honor you. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for this bread and this cup. We praise you in Jesus' name. Folks, as you were led, please come forward and and, uh, partake of the Lord's table.
Hey, everybody. The song stuck in my head now, Cammie. In my heart, they ring the melody. So, got a few announcements. I got a couple that aren't on the, in your bulletin. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is an opportunity, if anybody wants to. Uh, so, Andrew and I, usually every year, we, we go with Art Hladic and a bunch of us, and we go out to Word of Life. We take some teens out, and I know Lydia's been, and uh, Maddie went one year, but, but I know she went out after that. But So we, we take a group of teens. We're going to take them in July this year. And so if you're a teen so between going into seventh grade up to twelfth grade and you want to join, you want to do, you know, uh, you can – Check with your parents. There's some videos on wordoflife.com. The 7th and 8th graders will be going to a place called The Ridge. And then if, if they're in high school, 9th to 12th, they will be going to a, the island. And that's an island, and the kids will all go there. Um, so if you want to be part of that, we, we would love to have any teens that want to come. It, it, they have a great time. And, and if there's any adults that wanted to maybe drive some kids out or – drive some kids back, or they, they could drive kids out and drive them back. They could, our art has some bunks, and there's some tent sites there all available. So, so if you want to be involved with that, we're going to have a meeting April 3rd over in South Paris, and you can see me for more details. And the other thing is that maybe you know a teen that maybe doesn't have a relationship with God or with Jesus, and, and you think this would be a great opportunity for them to come out and and that would be all paid for. They won't have to come up with the money. We, we would send them out. There's money set aside for that. Or, or even the teens, if, if you're coming out and you want to bring a friend that's not a believer, you know, that would be all, all covered. So, so it's a great opportunity for both our church, our church family kids and then the, maybe some kids that we, God has put in our past that we can, we can reach out to. So want to leave that and if you have any more questions let me know I'm trying to think if there's anything else here but you don't have to so if you have a teen or somebody you don't have to get them out to New York we'll we'll take them out and we'll get them back for you so all right the other thing is we're having the floors cleaned in the church here this week so we need some help after church today to start getting some of the, these chairs and getting everything cleaned out upstairs, downstairs, and it's going to be a job, but I know if there's enough hands, it should be light work, and hopefully there'll be some good organizing, and we can make some room in all the places we need to make it to get everything to fit, so, but they'll do the carpets, they're going to do the tile, so, and I know it's short notice, but what he, he offered quite a discount, because he was a little slow this time of year, the gentleman doing it, so. But it's going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week. So as a result of that, we usually have Wednesday night uh, prayer group right here. And so we're going to move that to Monday night. So and that's, that's in your bulletin. It'll be so tomorrow night at 6, if anybody wants to come, I, I, know, it, I know we plan on Wednesday night, but just with everything getting clean, we, we can't do it. So we're not going to miss it. We're going to have it Monday instead. And then it also says the Bible study that's normally Wednesday mornings downstairs, that's going to be at Roland and Barbara's house. So if anybody comes to that, just just head up the road instead. Next place up. Okay, we have out, out in the foyer, we have Aileen has put together the directories and, and just put a check mark if all the information is correct on that. And that's just a draft. And so if something's not correct, fix it. And if your name's not on it, see Aileen, and she'll she'll make sure you get on there. So, um, so your book, book club is today after the service, so we may have to leave a few chairs downstairs on the table for everybody there, and, and same for the kids' Bible club. So, so we'll leave a few things, and then then we'll get them out of there by by tomorrow night. Daylight savings time, don't forget that next week, so you get to church on time, or, or closer to on time maybe, and I don't think I have anything else, is there anything I'm missing, any 
Okay, all right, let's pray, and then we'll have a fellowship time, and then we'll come back in, and Chuck's going to give us a message today. So. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, we just thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity for all of us to meet and gather in your name, Lord, and we, we thank you for the music that we lifted up to you, Lord, today, and we just thank you for all the different opportunities you present to us each and every day, each and every week, Lord, and we just pray that you would guide us in decision-making in those opportunities, Lord, and, and we pray that you'd be with the kids downstairs today, Lord, as they have Sunday school and, and then the group tonight, Lord, and we just pray for all these things in your name. Amen.
Okay, um, we're going to get going, and just to follow up on one of the announcements, um, with respect to the chairs and, and cleaning all the chairs or pulling out all the chairs out of the sanctuary, there is a, a follow-up to that, and that is to put all the chairs back. So, unless we want to be sitting on the carpet come next Sunday morning, um, we need to replace the chairs that we moved today. So we're going to do that 
Saturday, well, probably around this coming Saturday around five o'clock or so. Oh, everybody can get there. <laughs> That's right. That otherwise we'll still meet at five on Saturday, um, just to put the chairs back. Okay, uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to be here today, to look into your word, uh, to consider what it is that you would teach us from it and how to apply it to our lives. Strengthen us, Father, guide us, and may we give all glory, honor, and praise to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. I was mentioning... Um, at communion, you know, the wonder of music and the joy of music and, and all of that. And what was interesting is, is three, the majority of the songs that we sang today had one word that they shared, and it was darkness, dark or darkness. And that is actually very, that's related to or, or the central theme of what I'm talking about today, which is darkness and how we deal with it and learn from it uh, in our lives. And to go with that, I'm going to tell just a short little story. And the great thing about getting a little bit older is that you kind of forget what stories that you've told. So every story that you tell is brand new to me. Okay. Now, you may have heard it before, but just entertain me and smile and nod if you've heard it before. Um, and I know that I'm not alone in this, but it seems to be happening more and more. Anyway, when I grew up, we stayed summers uh, at our tree farm in Hartford. Okay, again, no power, no lights, none of that sort of stuff. Um, it was remote. And back in 1975, I was 12 years old, and we... My cousins and my brother and sister and I always either did like a play that we would put on for our parents or some sort of thing like that. Well, the summer of 1975 was the year of The Lord of the Rings, okay? We had all read The Lord of the Rings trilogy, and what we were doing is making a trail around our farm that kind of, of represented a path through Middle Earth. Okay, so for any of you who have read the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you had all your different spots. You had Mirkwood, which was a really dark place, and, and Lothlorien, which was a beautiful green place. And it was really neat, and we put a lot of time and effort into that. Well, there was one particular day. My brother and sister and my cousins were all gone, but I still wanted to go out and work on this path all by myself. Okay, so I had my rake and I had my clippers and a shovel, so I, here I am, 12 years old, lugging all these tools, probably half, three-quarters of a mile back into the woods on some little tiny trail. And yes, I was headed towards a place of deep darkness. It was a hemlock stand, very old hemlock stand, very, very dark, and um, hence the name we called it Mirkwood. Well, I'm 12 years old, at the time, and I had a fairly uh, good imagination. So I'm sitting here walking along saying, I wonder if I'm going to run into a moose. I'm all by myself. What happens if I run into a moose? And so you're, you're just cranking yourself up. You know, you're getting further and further back into the woods. You're cranked. Long story short, I got into the deepest, darkest part of this hemlock stand. And I'm walking along, and it's quiet, and all of a sudden I hear this thrashing and crashing and big objects moving around. And there, probably 25 yards away from me, was a mother moose and its calf running in the other direction. Well, I watched that for about three seconds, and I turned around and took off running the other direction through the field, taking a shortcut, which really wasn't a shortcut, through the fields, why I didn't drop all the tools, I don't know. They did slow me down, but about halfway back, I realized I was still carrying these tools. I dropped them and took off running the rest of the way. To hear me tell that story later in the day, my life was at risk. You know, I, it, this was the, I came close to death in the middle of Mirkwood in Hartford, Maine. The bottom line there, though, is 
I was in the deepest, darkest part of our property when this whole thing went on. And when you are in the dark, it's scary, you're alone, you're isolated, there is uncertainty as to what is going to be going on around you, you feel lost in some cases, lonely, all by yourself. That was where I was at that point in time at 12 years old. All of us will face darkness in our lives. All of us will face darkness that is, is manifested in many different ways. You may have outward darkness. You think of the situation in the U Ukraine right now. Certainly for the people who are wrapped right up in the middle of that, that is a time and a period of darkness. You can also end up having an inward darkness where you feel lonely, rejected, worthless, like you have no meaning in life or you're undergoing some trial that is crushing to you. We all face that at one time or another going through our lives. And, you know, darkness as you think of it, if you look in the dictionary, it says darkness is a period or a time of partial or total absence of light. So that's one way to look at darkness. And again, that, enters, that, that can put in your mind a period of uncertainty. I don't know what is around me. I don't know what's coming up from behind me. I don't know what's before me. It can be scary. Alternatively, it can be, or another definition is evil or wickedness. It could be periods, you know, within that context, things such as being unhappy or distressed, suffering from gloom or despair, um, lacking some spiritual or intellectual enlightenment. You are in the dark. You don't know what's going on. All, like I said before, all of us will face these trials, these hardships, these various life circumstances, and it does lead to fear and uncertainty, um, and at times feeling completely overwhelmed. Where do these times lead us? God doesn't put these things in our lives for no reason whatsoever. How do we deal with the emotions that come from those dark times? What is God trying to teach us? I'm going to read Psalm 88. And it's not too long, so bear with me as I go through the whole psalm. Um, this is not, as you'll hear, a psalm of joy and praise and thanksgiving. In fact, it is the exact opposite. And as we read it, you may ask the question, why is this even in the Bible? So let's read Psalm 88. O Lord, the God who saves me, Day and night I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of trouble, and my life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am a set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit in the darkest depths your wrath lies heavily upon me you have overwhelmed me with all your waves you have taken from me my closest friends and have made them repulsive to me I am confined and cannot escape my eyes are dim with grief I call to you O Lord every day I spread out my hands to you do you show your wonders to the dead do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, O Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. 
All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and my loved ones from me. The darkness is my closest friend. The darkness is my closest friend. This is a tough one to read. This is a tough one to understand. This is, this is a lament. Okay? This individual, we don't know the circumstances that, was facing, that were facing this particular individual, but we know just from reading this, he was in turmoil. This particular individual was in turmoil. And, you know, we can relate to it in different times during our lives. We may not have felt to this extent, but we have certainly felt the loneliness and despair and the gloom that this individual was feeling. If you go back just quickly, let's summarize some of the feelings that were going through this, the psalmist as he was writing this. In verses 1 and 2, O Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry out to you. This guy is crying out to God, pleading with him. He does recognize God as God. He does recognize that it is God who saves him. So this individual is a believer. He trusts in God. But he is shouting out for divine help. So here is a believer in despair, crying out to God for help. If you look then in verses 3 through 5, my soul is full of trouble. Uh, I am counted among those who go down to the pit. It describes his feeling. This, this section describes his feeling of despair, of how he is feeling separated and rejected, how he is filled with grief and sorrow. He's not sugarcoating it. Okay? He's laying his feelings out before God, exactly how, his, how he's feeling. Then if you look at verses 6 through 12, he starts, what does he do? He starts to shift the blame to God. Okay? That's why I was kind of reading it with a little bit of emphasis there. You, you God, have put me in the lowest pit. You, God, have taken my friends. I call to you, but you ignore me. You don't respond. Here he is, he's lashing out with sarcasm, and he, you know, he, he just starts saying things like, you know, really, and you can imagine the tone, if he was speaking, you can imagine the tone of his voice, okay? Uh, do you show your wonders to the dead? Okay? Uh, is your love declared in the grave? You know, he's ragging on God big time here. Um, he's saying, what is wrong with you, God? Why have you put me in this position? And then, in 13 and 14, okay, I cry out to you for help, God. And then in 14, but Lord, why do you reject me? Those feelings of rejection come out. So he's, he's a believer. He is airing out the things that are bugging him. He shifts the blame to God. And then he's crying out to God, why are you rejecting me? And then finally, you know, he wraps it up. And you can hear the despair as he closes out this psalm. You know, most psalms will end with, Lord, it's been tough, but you are awesome. And you're great, and praised be to you. This one ends out with, darkness is my closest friend. You have destroyed me. You have overwhelmed me. You have taken all of my, commandment, uh, my companions. Darkness is my closest friend. And this is like a huge slam. This is an insult. Uh, it's, you know, it's not you, God, who are close to me. It's this feeling of emptiness. That's closest to me. That's tough stuff. Brutally honest. This guy is being brutally honest in this psalm. So what do we learn from it? It doesn't end with joy. It ends with an insult and a despairing statement. 
Okay, so let's go, let's take a step back. That kind of sets the stage. We talk about outward darkness, and we've talked about it being things like evil in the world or actions or, or activities that are within your community or the area with which you live, uncertainty of work. All of these things can be outward darkness, and they can be challenging enough. These times of outward darkness can be extremely challenging, but if we feel the presence of God, if we're resting in God, resting in the strength and the redemption that comes through Jesus Christ, even in the midst of that turmoil, we can have that sense of peace. We can be at peace. But if you then wrap into that inward darkness, it's a whole different story. If you wrap into that feelings of abandonment, or rejection, or loneliness, if that is building in your life, it creates feelings that you're ignored by God. That really then creates a great darkness, a void, that results in that fear, and that isolation, and in fact, anger. And that can result, certainly, in having no peace in your life and no rest in your life. So it's all tough stuff, and it's all explained, or all laid out there on the table in Psalm 88. So what do we learn from it? I've been setting the stage. Um, in looking at some commentaries and, and listening to some sermons by Tim Keller, there are four points that I want to bring out with this. Four simple points of things that we can learn from Psalm 88. Point number one is that darkness for a believer can last a long time. It's one of those things. Darkness, even for a believer, periods of darkness can last a long time. Number two, there is no better place than times of darkness to learn of God's grace. So there's no better time or no better place to learn of God's great grace than during times of darkness. Number three, there's no better place for a person to become a great person of God than in times of darkness. So becoming, using those times of darkness to become a great person of God. And then four, the fourth thing to remember here is that the darkness that we deal with is not permanent and it's not absolute. The darkness that we have to deal with is not permanent nor absolute. So let's go through those four, okay? And I'll try to do this without keeping us for an excessive period of time. Point number one, okay? Point number one, if you remember, is darkness can last a long time in a believer's life, okay? Darkness certainly will fall on believers, okay? It happened to this psalmist, and one of the other big ones that we think about is Job, okay? Job was a believer. Job was somebody who loved God, and yet he fell into a prolonged period of extreme darkness, all right? <clears throat> so if it can happen to central figures in the Bible, it certainly can happen to us. Okay, the Bible is very true. The Bible presents life in its reality. It does not sugarcoat things. The Bible does not say that once we become Christians, everything is cool, everything is good, we will not suffer trials, we will always be happy. The Bible does not say in this life we will always be happy. Okay? And when we think about it, when you think about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was rejected by the leaders of his, of his country, of his faith. He was abandoned by his companions, and he was tortured and killed. This is the Son of God, and he went through all of that. In John 16, 
Christ goes on to say, look, in this world, you will have trouble. He's laying it right out. Don't expect a free ride. Don't expect an easy time. As a believer, a follower of Christ in this life, you're going to have times of trouble, times of darkness, times of hardship. One of the key things there, though, is our expectations. What, our, what are our expectations in life? And that's going to lead us to how we deal with these particular troubles. If we expect, if we go into our daily life saying, I'm a believer, and because I'm a believer, things are going to be cool, and I'm going to be happy all the time, and it's going to be great, um, no troubles for me, that's not aligned with God's word. That is not lined up with what God is telling us life is going to be like. And we will be sadly mistaken. And in fact, our expectations will be dashed. You know, and this can be particularly challenging for a young Christian who comes in, who thinks, my sins are forgiven, and for one reason or another thinks life is going to be really cool. And no big deal, no big troubles. And that is not how it is. Um, and when that reality sets in, it can really start to drive home the feelings of isolation and failure. Okay? What we need then is be, are to live our lives with expectations that are set on a biblical reality. Biblical reality and truth. That there will be tough times. That there will be hardships. It sets us up in a different way, a different mindset. And that God is going to use these times, use these difficult periods of time to teach us and to strengthen us and to encourage us. So yes, believers will have prolonged periods of darkness and suffering in their lives. But God is using that in a way to strengthen and encourage Point two, dark times can show God's amazing grace. If you read the psalm again, and go home and read it again, the psalm is, the psalmist is being sarcastic, he is being disrespectful, and almost blasphemous to God. He is insulting, and he's exaggerating. Okay? Now, that being said, this is, what, this is the, the argument that God, that the psalmist is laying out before God. Sarcastic, angry, uh, insulting, exaggerating. <clears throat> How many of you have ever been in a discussion that has all of those components? Okay? If anybody is... is is honest with themselves, and if you are a parent and you're honest, you have been in one of those discussions where you have it all planned out how you're going to have this discussion and it's going to be nice and orderly and neat, and the next thing you know, it is off the rails, and somebody is calling you an idiot, and you don't know anything, and you're the dumbest thing that could be, your, you've got your head stuck in the, in the hole in the ground. That's what the psalmist is doing before God. Why is this in the Bible? Why would, why would God put that in the Bible? And the answer is that God understands how we're going to speak when we are in despair. God recognizes how we will feel when we are in despair and when we are in fear and trial. And yet, he doesn't reject us. He doesn't reject us. God is a God of grace. So he hears us. We can cry out to him. We can be honest with him. But because of his grace, because of his mercy, he does not reject us. 
His, it's in this overwhelming grace that God understands us and that he loves us. So that's one of these things to remember. As we get into darkness, times of darkness, we may scream out to God in frustration, in despair, but we know he has grace, and we can learn of that grace through those times. Now, point number three. In darkness, we can become a great person of God. We can grow in our Christian walk. We can grow in our sanctification. We can grow to be more like Christ through these difficult and hard times. Think about it. This psalmist is railing against God. He is angry. He is frustrated. He is scared. But he is saying it to God. He is talking to God. It's like, you know, you have somebody that you care about and that you love, and you have a, a difficult thing going on with them. The thing you need to do is be able to go to talk to that person. The worst thing that you do is you leave that person alone, you go over, you start talking behind their back, and, you know, you're not showing any love by not working it out with that person. By ignoring them, by thinking somebody else is going to solve that problem, or just by making yourself look good because you're ragging on them to somebody else. That's not the way to deal with it. This person is crying out directly to God. Similar to Job. Okay? If you look at Job, a little bit different path, but if you look at Job, okay, Job was a righteous man, and he was blessed by God. Okay? Satan then goes to God, and he questions God, and he says, look, Job only serves you, Job only praises you because you give him stuff. He's only praising you because you give him things. You take that stuff away from Job, he's going to be angry with you, and he will curse you. So, the question then is, where are we with God? All right? Do we love God because he gives us stuff? Do we love God because... He blesses us with things. Is that why we love God? Or do we love God for who he is? Do we love God for himself? Are we self-centered or are we Christ-centered? That really starts to come out during times of darkness. Are you angry with God because you're not getting the stuff that you think you deserve? Honestly, there are a lot of times when each one of us will love God for what he gives us and not just for who he is. If we're honest, that happens. You know, and in human relate, you see it happen in a way in human relationship. In many times, many people may feel used. You have somebody who you think cares about you, who thinks... They like you, they love you, but in fact, that person may be only acting that way towards you so they can get something that they want. They are using that person. And it's a terrible feeling when you realize that you are being used. Whether you're being the one who's being used, that's a bad thing to feel that way. If you're the one doing the using, you need to smack yourself in the head and be taking a deep look at yourself and how you think about relationships. But if that is our relationship with God and we don't grow beyond it, then we're going to be spending our lives being buffeted by trials and temptations. If we're sitting here living our lives thinking that 
Our primary focus is the blessings that God gives us. If that is our focus, then those times of trial and temptation and hardship will blow us around like a ship in a storm. And we will never have peace or rest in this life. Job and the psalmist were angry. And they said angry, hurtful things, but they were saying them to God, and they were prayers of desperate men. They ended up ultimately sticking with God through thick and thin, loving God for himself. Loving God for who God was. And through that, Satan was defeated. Go back and you look at Job. Job stuck with God. He was angry. He cried out in prayer. He was frustrated, but ultimately he stuck with God. Satan was defeated. Job was able to rejoice again. Hold on to God. So, what's the point with this third point? Hold on to God through these dark times. Don't let your faith be self-centered. Don't let your faith be one of what am I getting. Love God for who he is, not for what he gives you. Love God for who he is with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Keep those prayers going through those hard times. You may be crying out in despair, but keep crying out to God. He will bless you. God will, and through those hard times, God will turn you into a person of stability, of endurance, of strength, and a person who is filled with God's greatness and God's love. All right, fourth point. We're wrapping it up here. Dark times can seem total and absolute. But in reality, the dark times that we face in this life are temporary, and actually they can be useful. Okay? If you go back and you do a little research on Psalm 88, the writer of Psalm 88 was a guy named Heman. Right? And he was part of a group. He was a writer of Psalms all right, back in David's time. And if you go back and you look, many of the Psalms that he was involved with, that his group wrote, were psalms that were joyful and thankful and praising God. So here it was during a difficult, difficult time that Haman was going through, and yet he was writing psalms that God placed in his word. And for centuries since that time, God has been using this work of Haman to strengthen, to encourage, to teach. God used this difficult time in Heman's life as a way to teach others and to encourage others that has gone for way longer than probably Heman ever thought that it would, with results far beyond what Heman could ever imagine. So Heman didn't see his darkness as temporary, but God could, and he molded him and, and used him to accomplish God's will. Now I'm going to take this one step further. If you look at Psalm 88, how did it end? It ended with, darkness is my closest friend. If you look back at Psalm 39, which is the other psalm in the book of Psalms that is really a downer, where somebody is just pouring out their heart and, and in a lament. And it ends with asking God, just look away from me. I am miserable. I am under trials. Look away from me. Okay? So darkness is my closest friend and look away from me. Does any of that sound familiar? Matthew 27. Christ's crucifixion. Darkness settled in from the sixth hour to the ninth. Darkness settled in around Christ from the sixth hour to the ninth. 
And what did Christ cry out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ suffered, Christ suffered total darkness, total darkness from God. He took God's full wrath and God turned away from him. And why? Christ was carrying our sin. Jesus suffered God's wrath so that we might be saved from it. Christ went through that period of total darkness, total separation, so that we wouldn't have to. Christ went through the total darkness so that we don't have to. We will go through dark times, but Jesus went through the darkest to give us hope, to give us life, to give us love. And in our darkest time, if we're resting and trusting in Christ, we know and we can know that God will not abandon us because what Jesus has done. And we will not need to feel abandoned. So, I'm going to wrap it up now. Psalm 88, verse 10. Let me reread that. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do the dead rise up and praise you? Guess what? If you believe in the resurrected Christ, the answer is a resounding yes. The answer is a resounding yes. Because of what Jesus has done and of God's abounding grace, yes, the dead will rise from the, from the grave and praise him. Absolutely. And we can rejoice in that. There will be times of darkness. There will be times of hardship. There will be times of loneliness and isolation. But think back to what we opened, what we read for Scripture to start the service with. Psalm 18, verse 10. You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. In the darkest times, God is the one who brings us through, who gives us hope, who strengthens us and helps us to grow through those dark times. Cry out to him, yield it to God, trust in him, and know that he will hold you to the end. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you. Lord, as we face dark times, help us not to turn from you. May we cry out. May we yield it all to you. May we not be self-centered in our thoughts and our deeds, but Lord, may we love you and know that you will guide us through it. Give us your strength today, tomorrow, and until Christ comes again, praising and honoring you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is a Redeemer. His name is Jesus. The question is, is he your Redeemer? If not, today, today could be the day. Won't you stand with us and sing, There is a Redeemer. Jesus, God's own son.
Folks, go forward this week. And yeah, when dark times come, know that Jesus loves you, that God has great mercy and grace and will hold you in his hand, and that he leaves the Spirit to work with you and to guide you and to love you all your life. Praise God. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.